Hello and welcome to Talking Health. I'm Mike Gilliam. Over the next half hour, we'll take a look at technology and innovation in healthcare. We'll examine everything from healthcare applications or apps and how they're being utilized and regulated to new high-tech medical devices to robotic surgery and how it's being used. We'll talk to technology innovators and doctors on the front lines. And our program will have a different look with more reporting from outside the studio. So let's get started with this booming area of healthcare apps and a company called Haptic. It seems these days applications or apps are everywhere in our lives. Music apps, game apps, navigational apps, you name it, there's an app for that. And that is also becoming true in the field of healthcare. One of the medical app platforms is Haptique. It stands for Health App Boutique. Corey Ackerman is the president. Haptique is a health application platform that enables organizations, whether it's an enterprise or a physician practice, uh, to help manage, distribute, uh, locate applications for clinicians to use on their own and also to prescribe them to patients. This is kind of a booming industry, right? Yes, it's exploding. Uh, the number of applications generally on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store have grown enormously over the past couple of years. The healthcare application category uh, particularly so. So there's over 40,000 healthcare related applications now across the different platforms. Now, are we just talking about apps that uh, you would use if you're going to go jogging, that sort of thing, or are we talking about things that are much more sophisticated? Both. So they, they, they range from very simple to take a pill every hour to uh, it's going to do an ECG on a patient. Here's how it works. We've organized the applications by profession and also uh, by topic. So um, if I go into professional apps by topic, um, I'm going to go in and start to see a listing of all sorts of different clinical topics, um, diabetes being one of them. So if I go into um, endocrinology, um, endocrine or metabolic medicine, um, if I'm looking at this, um, you start to see um, applications of a, a broad range that might affect, uh, affect those disorders. So if a person was a diabetic, what type of app might be prescribed for them? There are some that have come to market more recently um, actually do testing with testing strips inserted into an attachment to the phone or the iPad and the data gets read off the testing strip into the application and stored there and logged there automatically. And so uh, some of these applications are FDA approved um, and so the, the sophistication is just increasing. Um, so that, that is a, essentially a medical device that's testing your blood sugar using an application. Currently, applications are purchased directly by the consumer shopping or browsing the Apple App Store or the Android Marketplace, or they can be prescribed by a doctor. If a doctor is looking at this application and wants to prescribe it to a patient, they would push uh, the prescribe button um, and a window pops up where they can enter in the patient's name and email, and this app is now included in the record. They could put a note in the comments field, and the patient will get an email with a link to get this application and our platform is agnostic, so it, it enables uh, apps to be prescribed, whether they're on, a, on a, an Android platform or an, an Apple iOS platform, or um, even if it's a, something like a video or a, a PDF document. Um, so we have some of those in the system as well. Um, not everything needs to be an application. We're focused on applications, but um, think of all, all, all the papers you get when you leave a hospital, uh, discharge papers, information, things to read, and pretty overwhelming. So what we're, we're doing is we're enabling that to be prescribed and sent via email. All those PDFs and all those documents that you may lose on the way home or misplace um, now are prescribed to you and stored on your device and read when you can. Are doctors really embracing this? It, it, it's early days for sure, um, but there's, there's an extreme amount of interest and excitement about this. Um, they're excited because it, it'll be an additional way they can engage with their patients. What's the neatest app you've seen here in your work? Uh, on the healthcare space, yeah. the neatest app might be that, that ECG app from LiveCore. It essentially, uh, you put your thumbs on the back of the phone on an attachment, it, it does an ECG, it's, it's fantastic. Where do you see the future of, of apps going, say, over the next five years? Think about the internet in 1980. Uh, 1998 and, and what it is today. Um, think of that with the healthcare data and these databases that can be created 
blinded and aggregated to protect patient privacy, but now be used to do uh, things like clinical decision support, recommend applications to be purchased um, based on a specific patient type, um, based on what insurance plan you might be on, just amazing things. Haptique is at the forefront when it comes to healthcare apps. In March, the company's chief executive officer, Ben Choder, traveled to Capitol Hill to testify before the House Committee on Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. And before he could even get started, that company name, Haptique, was on the tip of many a lawmaker's tongue. For our hearing on health information technology harnessing wireless innovation, I want to welcome our witnesses and our participants in today's hearing. We'll now go to Mr. Ben Choder, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Haptique. Haptique, like health app boutique. Exactly. Haptique. <laughs> Everybody with me now. <laughs> All right, Mr. Choder, you're on. What was your message when you testified on Capitol Hill? What I was trying to get to my message to Congress was the FDA came out with their draft guidelines in July of 2011. And they went out there. And what we were trying to say is, hey, it's 2013 now. We need those guidelines. There's too many unknowns. It's not fair for the app developers who don't know if I go into the marketplace, am I going to have to pull my app when the FDA comes out with their regulations or their certification rules? Or there's all these great innovations, these app guys out there who are like, whoa, I'm not even going to go into the marketplace yet because I have no idea what the FDA is going to do. So one, we need them to do it so developers can continue. Two, we need it so patients are safe with the apps. And I think that's the number one thing we try to convey to Congress. Why is that certification so important? Well, part of the, the biggest issue in this entire space is, one, there's not a lot of barrier entry to building an app. You and I could go home tonight and we could build an app and we could buy some software to build an app. And in a couple days, if we follow Apple's guidelines, we could have it on the iTunes store. So where are all these apps coming from? Not that anyone ever went out there to try to make apps bad or have malware on them or not secure on purpose, but no one's looking at it. And when you think about it, when I, if I build Angry Birds, it's a game. But if I'm building an app that's going to be used in a clinical setting, that one, maybe a clinician is going to make a clinical decision on it, or two, it's just a reference app, we need to have more guidelines because we're dealing with patients. And it's not just a game. So this information needs, people need to know where it comes from. And if I was a clinician, I don't think I'd want to engage with a patient with, or, unless I knew where that app came from. So I need to cut through the clutter of so many apps out there. Who should really regulate these apps? It has to be the FDA. On um, ones that are clinical. Anything that will turn my device into a clinical decision. So if it turns my phone into an EKG, FDA has to handle it. If it takes in data and it will make an algorithm that a doctor or a clinician might make a decision to do surgery, has to be under the FDA, at least in my opinion. Should not be a public facing company like Haptique or anyone else who's going to get into certification space. What types of apps should not have to fall under the FDA? Anything that's a reference app, anything that's a fitness app, anything. Or a diet app. Yeah, exactly. Anything that you can use normally that no one's going to make a life and de death decision over. Currently, the way this is all set up, um, we're using the regular commercial wireless yeah. airwaves. Yeah. Is that going to change? Is there going to be a different spectrum? There's a lot in going on um, in Washington about freeing up more spectrum for medical transmission of wireless data. So think about it as we go forward with you know, EMRs and EHRs and, and PHRs, your per personal health records. How am I going to get this data? Or more and more apps are sharing data. So in other words, I could wear a blood pressure cuff and that information can be sent instantly to a portal that my doctor has. Where is, what, what spectrum is that going to be sent from and, or through? And I think that's the area that the government's basically saying, we'll open up more spectrum. We will. We know this data needs to be shared. And so that's what they were talking about. Now, where do you see this going over the next five years, though? It's a, it's a very new business that yep. has grown a lot over the last five. Yep. Where do you see it going? Well, look at it this way. I think that in five years from now, 75% of this country will somehow be interacting with mobile health, whether it's for my personal health records, whether it's sharing blood data or it's monitoring. Um, and I think monitoring has only tipped the iceberg. It's going to get to the point that everyone, one way or another, will be monitoring their health through their devices, smartphone devices.
Well, is that going to take the place of the doctor ever coming into my house or me ever having to go to the doctor's office? I think what it's going to do is going to, it's going to cut down the times when you're going to the clinician where you just don't know. Like, you know, if, if, you, if, you, feel, if you have a heart condition and you feel it's beating a little fast or you don't know, the first thing I would do, I'm running to the ER or the doctor's office. But if I had a device that's sending information and it looked fine to me but I still wasn't secure about it, I can contact my clinician or my care manager and he could say, oh, I'm looking at it right now. Don't worry about it or get in here now. To me, I think it's going to save more lives and it's going to cut down the cost of constantly going to the ER or it's also going to make me just a little less nervous. Or me as a, as, at, at the age where my parents are now, if I could be monitoring my parents and knowing, oh, her heart rate's fine and her blood pressure is fine, to me that's really cool. FDA-approved apps and medical devices are not just being used to monitor our aging population. Some are making a difference in the lives of the youngest among us. Melissa Rose Cooper brings us a story about one of them. Hi, David. How are you today? Good. Good. Children like David here. are admitted to Brooklyn's Wyckoff Heights Medical Center weekly for treatment of their asthma. You would amaze to hear that compared to nation and the state, this neighborhood has a almost double the admissions in the hospital, double the visits in the emergency room. Dr. Sanjivan Patel, along with his team of doctors and nurses, are working to decrease those visits using a new high-tech wireless device known as Asmapolis. Each day, millions of Americans carry and use inhalers to relieve asthma symptoms. The FDA-approved device is placed at the top of the inhaler. Internal sensors record when and where the inhaler is used any time the patient takes a puff. That information is then sent to the doctor. Patients and physicians can track the results online or on their cell phones. What this kind of technology can do is really uh, bring, for the first time, an accurate and reliable record into um, you know, the decisions that a physician's making about how to course correct treatment to, to get um, you know, all that we can out of asthma treatment and to do so without adding a bunch of time and effort you know, to the day-to-day -day burden on a, on a family or household. We put a little sticker with a plastic cover and then this is what attaches to that. When the, the Pediatric nurse manager Rachel McKenney says the technology has been a help in managing treatment for the 31 patients now using the device. You can log on and see, are they using their medicine as prescribed? Yes, no. Are they using the rescue inhaler more than they need to? Yes, no. So with that information, we can reach out to the families before clinic visit to make sure that they're okay. Nine-year-old Jeremiah is one of those patients. His mother, Myra Ortiz, is pleased with how it's working. One thing that I love is that I get texts the other night, in the middle of the night, my phone buzzes and I'm like, it just caught me off guard. No one calls my phone at that time. So it was Asmopolis letting me know that he had used the rescue inhaler. So that let me know that he wasn't feeling well. If I wouldn't have gotten the text, I would have never known because he just would have went right back to sleep. Wyckoff Hospital is currently the only medical facility in New York to use the Asmopolis technology. But its creators are hoping to spread these devices to others very soon. Research from other medical facilities around the country using Asmapolis shows usage of the device reduces visits to the emergency room. Dr. Patricia Willard Pickens hopes the same will happen at Wyckoff. So far it's been just nothing but positive feedback, people just being really uh, happy to be informed and happy to get calls from the doctors, you know, which couldn't happen before. We didn't know when they were getting out of control. Now we see you've been using your medicine more. We can give a call so the families really feel like they can feel our concern. It's a win-win situation. And I think that's the future. It's a digital health. We'll get you started as soon as possible. As soon as you a future that eliminates the need for children like David to have to be admitted to the hospital every week. I'm Melissa Rose Cooper for Talking Health. The Asmopolis appears to be giving a lot of people peace of mind. Now, obviously, strides in healthcare technology are not all centered on smartphones and tablets. Great things are also happening in operating rooms of hospitals and major medical centers. Ardana Hanover got the scoop on some real advancements in robotic surgery. Meet the Da Vinci Surgical System. It's a robot that is allowing surgeons like Dr. Nira Patal, director of cardiac surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, to perform complicated procedures with computerized precision. Da Vinci robot helps us do the same operation which a human being does, 
through much smaller incisions. If I have to get inside the heart with my conventional instruments, then I need a much larger incision. Small incisions mean much less bleeding and a shorter recovery time. I'm just going to show it with a size-wise how small it is. And then if you can zoom it on the screen, what I would see on the console is this big. Using a mannequin, this demonstration shows how robotic scalpel instruments are inserted into a patient. This is three-dimensional, high definition, with precise movement, so allows you to do precise work which you need for heart surgery. Robotic surgery is not automatic surgery, however. The doctor's in total control at all times. Everything has to go in and out through a one small hole, so you cannot change your mind and stuff like that. You have to do it in a precise manner. Seated at a panel with foot and wrist controls, he directs the robot's every move. What if something went a little differently than you expected it? Can you move away from the da Vinci surgery in the middle of an operation? Yes, exactly. It is very simple. As you can see over here, these are the three holes we have made in this mannequin to put the instruments. If the operation is not going right or we think that this patient is not suitable for robotic, we just take these instruments out, roll the cart away, I scrub in, and make an incision in a standard way. Robotic procedures inside the patient must be precise. These delicate, flexible instruments operate with an almost infinite dexterity in the smallest of spaces. This is a technology which has to enhance what we do. It cannot replace what we have been doing for all these years. So again, it has to be used with caution, right procedure for the right patient. This robot isn't the end of the scalpel, but it definitely gives surgeons an extra set of hands when it counts the most. I'm Donna Hanover for Talking Health. How are doctors applying all this new technology? Are they embracing it, and where will it take us? To get some answers, we sat down with the Assistant Clinical Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine and Director of Labor and Delivery at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Annette Perez Delboy. Doctor, you know a few things about this robotic surgery. Tell me, tell me about that. How, how are you using it? We do a lot of sonographies and we have a center for prenatal pediatrics in which we uh, diagnose babies with, with complications or problems. So the robot is now used for pediatric surgeries, which is pretty amazing that they can use a robot for a baby or an infant. For our oncologist, using it to dissect little nodes in the pelvic area. It can do a lot of minimal invasive technology in which it's very precise in where they're going and what they're going to do. How are you using it? I'm usually using it with a um, abdominal cerclage, just putting a cerclage uh, around the uh, cervix of women who loses who lose their babies. Uh, so this will prevent miscarriages. Sure. Okay, and how does that work? So the way uh, we do it is just like a normal laparoscopy, so it involves the same thing as a laparoscopy. The only difference is we'll use the robot instead. It would be less invasive for the patient. Their recuperation time is less. Their pain is much less. And also the robot is a little bit more skilled to go precisely where we want it to go. I didn't have to dissect the bladder. All I need to do is two tiny holes, patch, pass the stitch around it, and just tie it. How are patients reacting to this? I think patients are still, like anything new, they're still a little bit skeptical. So they, you know, they like the, the old way uh, of doing it. But a lot of patients come specifically, you know, for that reason, because they know we do it and we perform this, uh, uh, this procedure. They still kind of don't understand the robot or where the robot is in the room where we're working with it. And we try to explain to them that it's the same thing as a laparoscopy, you know, but we have a, you know, we have a machine that, that we're watching to a, through like a microscope or a telescope, and we, we, we work the machine through that. Now, would you ever want to go back to the old way? Uh, no, I, I think it's, it's more precise. Doing it with this machine is more precise. I can do very minuscule movement, small movement, and know exactly where I want to go. So, uh, no. I mean, we also have to talk about some of the drawbacks. I mean, it takes much longer. You know, it, it costs much more money using this big machine. You know, you got to pick the, the patients that really you could use this with. And some patients, you, it might not benefit. It might not be cost effective. So those are the decisions that sometimes we have to 
think when we use this machine. Can you be more specific about the cost situation and how this would differ from the previous types of procedures? Well, the difference is, I mean, just placing the robot, it has to be in a specific location. It has to be, you know, you know, the machine's man of manpower to use it, the, the time that it takes, the, the time that the patient is asleep and everything. So all that is time in the, you know, the longer you take, it's time in the OR that you could be doing another case or you could do, so that's why it, it costs more money. It, it also, you know, cleaning all the things and everything else, it, it usually it involves spending more money. So there's more involved than just setting up the robot and this is Correct, it, it takes, it's a little bit more time consuming, yes. Electronic medical records, you like them. I love them, I think it's the best thing ever. Why? Uh, why? I think charts are illegible. You know, people write and handwritings are difficult. Uh, sometimes things get lost, papers get misplaced, misfiled, and you can't find any information. Uh, charts are going to remain in one office, so there's no way of sharing charts among colleagues. Uh, so if you, you know, I'm an obstetrician and I need to send a patient to a cardiologist, unless I call them and they fax me something, I won't get that information. I think when we have an electronic chart, uh, we're able to type, it's legible, it's understandable. You know where to find your labs, you know where to find uh, your prescriptions, the drugs the patient is using. And I can also find the consult. So if, I, I, if we are able to have the same medical record among all the specialties and faculties, I can read whatever they're doing and all the things my patients have. How far do you see this technology boom going as far as medicine is concerned? I mean, where, where do you think things will be in five years from now? I think with tablets and everything that we're doing, uh, in, I think we could do a lot of telemedicine. Uh, one of the things I have always said, we do a, I do a lot of sonography, you know, 2D sonography, 3D sonography. And now we're up to 4D, so that means we can instantly do a sonogram to a patient and uh, have full image of the baby's face. And I think that a lot of patients come hoping for that. Maybe we could get some, some of our physicians to be on vacation in Bali and be reading sonograms with telemedicine, you know, or, or doing other procedures. I think telemedicine is the key to some, uh, you could do some of our patients uh, that can't come to the office or anything, and you could um, do, uh, do the whole consult through telemedicine. The world of 3D is being used in more and more ways across the healthcare spectrum. I'm going to tell Isaac gives us a peek into the future. Yeah, this is the lobule or lobe. This is the conchal bowl. Um, it looks like a human ear and it feels like a human ear. That's because it's an exact replica of one, thanks to a printer, a 3D printer. 3D printing has been used for printing all kinds of objects, from toys to shoes to tools and gadgets. But recently, scientists have successfully bioprinted this ear using living cells. Dr. Jason Spector is one of the lead scientists in the field of bioregenerative medicine. He is part of a team of researchers at Cornell University. 3D printing is most useful because it can very accurately and precisely create a three-dimensional object. In the recent past, that was limited to making things out of liquid uh, or plastic polymers. It starts with a high-definition scan of an ear. That data will be used to create a blueprint for a new one. The dimensions of that ear are then fed into the printer. This enables the printer to produce perfectly accurate replicas. Instead of the plastics or metals typically used in 3D printing, here researchers are using living cartilage cells, which are printed layer upon layer to form the ear. In this case, we're using uh, collagen, which is a very common protein found throughout the body. We are uh, encasing uh, ear cartilage cells within that uh, protein matrix. And you can think of, instead of uh, ink in a printer, we're using the collagen as our ink. The printed ear is, however, not yet ready for transplant. One major obstacle researchers face is coming up with enough cells to create the ear. We hope to get this into kids um, using their own cells within the next couple of years and that's one of the challenges. In order to make this ear um, and put enough cells in it, it requires about 250 million cells. It's a little bit of a challenge right now and but we're certainly working on ways to do that because those cartilage cells have to come from that patient otherwise they would be rejected. One of the ways we're trying to turbocharge the expansion or the growth of these cartilage cells is by using stem cells. Um, 
culturing the cells together because stem cells uh, produce chemicals that can turbocharge the cells around them and even turbocharge themselves and cause them to become cells we need. An additional challenge scientists face in engineering human tissue is how to supply blood to the tissue. Now if we're talking about printing up more complex tissues or organs where you need a uh, framework within it to carry uh, blood and other nutrients known as the vascular architecture, that becomes much more difficult. And that's going to be a big challenge for bioprinters and tissue engineers and, and remains the primary challenge for tissue engineers going forward is how can we develop, not only uh, develop a vascular network within these tissues, but then I as the reconstructive microsurgeon have to be able to connect those tiny blood vessels to the vasculature within our body. Getting the cells is something that I think we'll be able to overcome by combining these technologies with our increasing understanding of stem cell biology. Spectre doesn't think these challenges are insurmountable. There's no doubt that in the next few years we will see many more applications. Um, the holy grail, so to speak, printing of vascularity or a vasculature, that's probably a little further off. I think we will overcome those challenges. I'm Amital Isaac for Talking Health. Technology and innovation in healthcare continue to improve by leaps and bounds, and all of us are benefiting. If the growth over the last five years is any indication of what's to come, there are great things in the future of healthcare and its delivery. Many trips to the doctor's office and the hospital could be curtailed, while at the same time improving overall patient outcomes. I'm Mike Gilliam. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Talking Health. This broadcast has been brought to you through a grant from the Commonwealth Fund.